<laughs> you were coding as we were uh I am, we yeah. That's great. Um <laughs> Hey, it's a busy week. Well, it's it's funny. So people always ask me advice for for how like how to get a career in astronomy. And of course, I don't really know. Um well, I sort of know. I know enough astronomers to know that it's rough. And um and so my advice is also learn computer programming as a backup. Yep. And because astronomers are, are kind of computer programmers too. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely yeah. the, uh, the advice that I've got. Yeah, no, that's a, that's great advice. That and statistics to understand statistics. That's a really versatile skill. Yeah. Uh, and one that's heavily needed, um, large data sets, just being able to manipulate large data sets. That's also very. Yeah. And people always yeah. like people always to learn computer say programming they're like bad. Oh, sorry, one second. Say they're bad at math, but. I, you know, I don't like it when people say that, that, right. that everybody's kind of bad at math. It's just about whether or not you've put in the practice to get to drill the, the mathematics and the formula into your, into your head. And statistics yeah. is, is a tough one. And but once you get it, then you're just doing the same statistical yeah. analysis on the same stuff again. And again, you know, like, yeah, I feel like math, statistics and coding are similar brain skills that mm -hmm. are not intrinsic their learned skills totally it's a way of thinking but there are there are at least four people i know who had very successful careers on kepler in their early years and then ended up leaving astronomy and have very successful careers in industry so um they're they're quite in demand yeah yeah absolutely so that's so i think you can't go wrong that's right um okay i'm gonna say hi to a bunch of people i'm assuming you can see us and let me know, as always, if I am too quiet, because this this is this is the thing that I'm trying to figure out. Hello to 526 Steve, Abdullah Zalamadi, Adam Synergy, Arnold Post, Astro B, Bill, Billy Gordon, Brian Yoko, Colin Jones, David Dunn, Dusty Reichwin, Dynamo Dan, Illid Avron, Fleming Thunberg, Galaxia, Giselle Sabarin, Graham Walbridge, Guido Bibra, John Gallant, John Southfield, Johnny Zed, Jorn Albert, Kay Tarab, Larry Beckham, Linda Sadik, Matt Minter, Michael Jobin, Nancy Graziano, Paul Taylor, Paul, Peter Quinn, Peter Schultz, Philip Verberthus, Pyro Nitro, Arinstro, thanks for the patronage, Arinstro. Uh, Reg Smith, SSI, Stephen Hawkins, uh, Tak Tang, The Toxic Yordle, and Yamagashi San. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. We will get started in about one minute. You've been warned. <laughs> um... How many of those names did you mangle? Oh, uh, they'll tell me. <laughs> Yeah, and sometimes I never, uh, I try and I try and I try and I just can't seem to get the uh, the the names right. It takes me a couple of weeks, and sometimes they have to get back to me. And like like Guido Bibra, who's a big fan, and uh, mm. and I, I had to get the Guido part. So, but now it's mm. in my head. I'll get it. Well, I'm impressed that you got Battaglia. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Well. <laughs> It's possible that I've seen you and heard your name referenced f from afar in in other stuff. You've done you've done some talks and stuff on the on just the a few. Yeah. <laughs> um. All right. Well, let's get started. <clears throat> so here we go. Turn that off. There's me. All right. I'm getting better at spelling your name. Uh, is everything ready to go? I believe it is. All right, let's go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, June 16th, 2017. This is, of course, the semi-penultimate episode. So we've got this and two more episodes until the end of the season for the Weekly Space Hangout. But thanks for joining us. This week, we're going to be talking about weighing a white dwarf. Uh, is the Milky Way in a cosmic void? The hottest planet no. ever? <laughs> wait, spoiler alert. <laughs> oh, wait, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> and spotting a hidden black hole. Uh, joining me this week, I heard someone's cell phone is going off. Hmm. Is that me? Maybe. Uh, joining, I'm going to move my cell phone far away from my court just to be safe. Uh, joining me this week, uh, regular Paul Matt Sutter. 
Reporting for duty. <laughs> Ready to debunk the thing that is absolutely in your area mm -hmm. of, of expertise. Maybe. 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 <laughs> um, and uh, special guest, Dr. Natalia, Dr. Natalie Battaglia. See, I got there it right go. beforehand, and then I got it wrong <laughs> in a second. Uh, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Uh, absolute honor to have you join us. And uh, so we're going to take a little while. We're going to talk about uh, your research, talk about uh, what you've been working on, how's, how's poor Kepler doing, and then... Um, poor. Poor oh, Kepler. Poor Kepler. <laughs> um, both the astronomer and the mission. Uh, all right. So let's, uh, before we do, I just want to remind everybody, this is a live show. You can, of course, go ahead and post some comments and questions. There's the, um, the YouTube live comments that you can go ahead and put your information in. And then there's also, of course, this chat down here, which is part of the WSH crew. Just go to WSH crew dot space join the slack community you'll find out they're behind the scenes we're all in there hanging out and talking to you so if you want to sort of take your love of the show to the next level then uh, go ahead and just join it's totally free and and really they're you know the the wsh crew is the group of people who organize this show who pick the special guests and reach out to them they are the executive producers of this show couldn't do this without them so join the join the community and one other reminder, which is that if you are watching the show live as a video or after the fact on YouTube, it is also available as a podcast. So if you want to, uh, if you like to do your listening, if you like to watch your shows through your ears and while you're riding the bike or doing chores, I totally get you. And we have a podcast. So you should be able just to Google search the, the URL for that. All right, let's get on with the show. Um, all right, Dr. Battaglia, uh, who are you? And what do you do? Who am I and what do I do? <laughs> um, well, uh, my official title right now is the Kepler Project Scientist. Uh, I've been working on the Kepler mission for 17 years now, since before it was even a mission. <laughs> so a very long time. It's really been my, uh, my entire career minus a postdoc. Uh, so just to, I guess, get everybody up to speed, Kepler is a space telescope. And it was NASA's or is NASA's first mission capable of detecting Earth-sized planets that are potentially habitable. And the way that it detects planets is through a technique called the transit method, whereby you measure the brightnesses of lots of stars simultaneously. You do that once every 30 minutes and you do it without blinking for as long as you can. So we did that for four years, staring at a field of view um, right on the edge of the summer triangle in between the constellations of Cygnus and, and Lyra, kind of tucked under the wing of Cygnus the Swan. Um, and then we shifted focus uh, because of some hardware glitches that we had. In fact, we finished our baseline mission. It was planned for four years, we executed four years. In, in fact, it was planned for three and a half and we executed four, so we got a little extra. Um, but when we had these hardware glitches, uh, we repurposed the spacecraft to do something slightly different. And instead of pointing at Cygnus, uh, we, for engineering reasons, we decided to point along the ecliptic. Uh, so for your viewership, what the ecliptic means is uh, the place in the sky where the zodiac, where the zodiacal constellations are. And so we've been doing that ever since. And it's been about four years since. So we got four years on Cygnus and we've had about four years on the uh, these ecliptic fields. Um, so that's the lowdown on what mm -hmm. Kepler is. I guess maybe I should also say that the original goal of Kepler, the reason why it was selected in the first place was to make one very specific calculation. And that's what fraction of stars in the galaxy harbor potentially habitable Earth-sized planets. Uh, so that's a number that we need in order to figure out if Earth planets or Earth-like planets are even common or not, and that is going to drive uh, future work to find evidence of life beyond the solar system. And you know, you're talking about that sort of the number of Earth-sized worlds that are out there, and trying to figure that out. I mean, you know, sort of plot those numbers into the Drake equation, and you know. You said, and we all know, we report on this quite a bit, how Kepler 
ran into some problems near the near the end of the mission. You say you were able to reach your you know that that mission length of the of the four years that you wanted, but in the last couple of years it's been I guess it's had a new job based you know I mean that sort of recovery. So can you talk a bit about sort of what went wrong, but also kind of the amazing recovery and what it's been working on since? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, here I have a model of the spacecraft on my desk. Um, the spacecraft. Oh, I thought on... it was behind you. No, <laughs> it's actually it's small and in front of you. <laughs> so um, there are these little doodads here, four of them, um, and they're reaction wheels. So they're basically like gyroscopes. And you need three gyroscopes at any one time to control the three rotation axes of a spacecraft around this finger, around this finger and around this finger here. <laughs> so those are the three axes of rotation. So you use three reaction wheels or gyroscopes to do that control. And Kepler, in order to obtain really, really precise brightness measurements required to detect Earth-sized planets, requires very, very stable pointing. We want to put a star right smack on a certain pixel on the detector, and we want to keep it there. Um, so this, this very stable pointing is achieved in part through these reaction wheels. So uh, as I said, we require three, there were four. Well, a few years into the mission, we lost one right off the bat. And uh, so then we were down to just the three. And then in 2013, actually it was on my birthday in 2013, I got a phone call uh, from our project manager that said that we had lost another reaction wheel. Mm. So now we were only able to control two axes of rotation. That third one was open loop and, and we didn't have a way of controlling it. So we thought it was over. And uh, but the engineers over at Ball Aerospace in Colorado actually came up with a very clever uh, way to control that third axis of rotation. And what they did was recognize that the spacecraft on one axis is symmetric. So right down the middle here, cutting the two solar panels, the spacecraft is almost perfectly symmetric. And so if you could point the spacecraft directly towards the sun uh, to balance radiation pressure, then you could control that third axis. Um, so I guess I should back up for a second and say that out in space, you might think, why do you need to control it at all? You just let it drift out there and it's going to stay pointing in the right exact same direction all the time. The problem with that is that the solar radiation is constantly streaming and hitting the telescope. And that very, very minute pressure from the solar radiation is enough to build up with time and actually exert a torque on the spacecraft that causes it to drift. Um, so if you can point the telescope straight upstream towards the solar radiation pressure, it's a bit like taking a rowboat and positioning it directly up the current so that you don't sway back and right. forth. So that's how we control the third loop. It's, now, what that... Well, that's, I mean, that's just phenomenal, right? That you essentially use the spacecraft as a solar sail, or actually the spacecraft was already a solar sail, and you minimized yeah. that 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 pressure that was pushing it off off course. Well, you're not minimizing it, you're taking advantage of it. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're using it to balance. Um, but what that meant is that we couldn't point anywhere, you know, we couldn't position the telescope anywhere, we had to point it we had to keep it along the ecliptic so that the sunshine sun was always orthogonal to or always pointing along that axis of symmetry and that's why we ended up having to point along the ecliptic that's that is an i mean i love those kinds of i mean the it's sad that those those uh gyros failed we've we actually have a sort of running joke about that in the show that i you know i i want to see tw you know 20 uh, gyros on spacecraft, like more and more redundancy. It always seems to be a part that fails. But but the fact yeah. that you were able to use that light pressure to be able to maintain the mission. So let's talk a bit about what you've been searching for with the reduced capabilities of Kepler after the the that last the ability to steer failed. Well, once Kepler started this its second life, and and I'll distinguish the two by calling the second life K two. Uh, because it's a second life, but also after the mountain K2 and, um, and the metaphor, if you will, um, of, a, of a mountain that's hard to climb. Uh, so 
the objective really shifted and it became a community telescope, uh, a guest observer telescope where every single science investigation is proposed through a competitive process by the scientific community. So the science community puts writes down the science that they want to do, submit it as a proposal. Those proposals are peer reviewed and the best science is selected. So it really became a more multi-purpose instrument that is serving you know, the supernova community, the extra galactic community, uh, detecting supernovae uh, to the solar system. It observed Neptune, it observed Mars. Uh, it does microlensing, uh, it searches, it does galactic astronomy and uh, has had some really great results uh, of stars in the Pleiades cluster and other clusters as well. It looks for planets and clusters. Um, it's doing galactic, what we call galactic archaeology, uh, which maps stars in the, in the galaxy and uh, gets their distances, measures their properties, and then starts to understand the three-dimensional structure of the galaxy and its history. Um, so it's just doing a really diverse set of, of science. Uh, and in addition to that, it's looking for exoplanets. And what we have found is that the focus now is on nearby stars and trying to find planets around nearby stars, like TRAPPIST-1, for example. Mm -hmm. um, because it's looking all across the ecliptic, it sees a broader swath of the sky, and therefore you have access to more nearby stars. And a, and a lot of the work that, that Kepler's been doing has been to sort of find these Earth-sized worlds orbiting around these smaller red dwarf stars, these M dwarfs, right? I mean, that's been a lot of the news that we've been we've been covering was it sort of a unexpected field of research to focus in on no not at all uh in fact uh right after kepler launched uh we went back and we added a lot of these m dwarf stars to the target list i mean the the objective of the first half of the mission kepler kepler prime we'll say uh, was to do a statistical study, a demographic study of exoplanets in the galaxy. How many planets are there orbiting stars of different sizes uh, and, and how many planets are there of different sizes and in different orbits? Um, and some of those are the M dwarfs. I think we observed about three to 5,000 M dwarfs um, on, the, on the target list in Kepler prime. Uh, the shift now towards M dwarfs for K2 is logical because most of the nearby stars are going to be M dwarfs. M dwarfs are the most common types of stars in the galaxy. So when you're looking at the nearby star populations, you naturally gravitate towards the M dwarfs. They're also really interesting because Earth-sized planets are easier to find around M dwarfs than they are around G-type stars, and their habitable zones are closer in. So you, you can detect um, repeated transits of a, a potentially habitable Earth-sized planet around the M dwarf more readily than you can around a G-type star. I've got a couple of questions that have come in from the uh, from the crowd, and I wanted to sort of run some of those past you first. Uh, one, what is the globe that's behind you? Everybody wants to know. And, <laughs> and for the listeners, she's got a globe that looks, you have yeah. to tell us what it is. Um, so that is an artist's rendering of the planet Kepler-10b which was the very first Earth-sized rocky planet that we discovered. Uh, we announced that discovery in 2011. And Dana Berry, a very talented artist, did um, a digital rendering, 3D rendering of the surface of Kepler-10b for our uh, graphics that we used in the press, uh, press release. But then he also got funding to do a National Geographic documentary, and he used a lot of that, those 3D renderings for the National Geographic documentary. Because it's a lava world, so Kepler-10b is a rocky planet, but it's orbiting about 30 times closer to its parent star than Mercury is to our own sun. So the star-facing side is act actually has temperatures in excess of that required to melt iron. Right. Not just rock, but, but iron, okay? It's really hot. So it has an entire hemisphere, this yellow part here, um, an entire hemisphere that's an ocean, but it's an ocean of molten lava, not an ocean of water. So anyway, he painted a globe of the Earth. If you look carefully, you can see the relief. You can see the Himalayas. And right. <laughs> but don't tell anybody. Uh, it also has this uh, really interesting 23 and a half degree tilt, just like the Earth, just like the Earth. Um, 
but he painted the globe uh, and then we used it as a prop for the documentary. So if you see his documentary called Finding the Next Earth, you will see that globe in, in part of the footage. Oh, that is awesome. Um, I think it's the only globe of an exoplanet that exists. Uh, or that, at least the first one. That's interesting. I mean, you can get like, I know you can get like one of Pluto and one of Mars, and I'd love yeah. to get one put 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 back there. But but yeah, to do a globe of an exoplanet, I think, uh, you know, there's some such amazing worlds out there, some interesting ideas. That would be really cool to do more of those. And I was looking yeah. for an opportunity. Uh, another question, uh, this comes from Graham Walbridge. What's the estimated life left before Kepler is closed down? Um, well, it depends on fuel usage. Um, there's a little bit of a hydrogen fuel on board uh, to desaturate the reaction wheels. Uh, but I think that we'll be able to go out through camp. The plan is to go out through campaign 19, which takes us, I think, through 2018. Uh, and then once the fuel runs out, we won't be able to take any more observations. Uh, we'll have to call it quits and, and shut it down. Uh, Brian Yuka wants to know, how does a typical conversation about the Fermi Paradox go within the Kepler mission team? Mm, good idea. Uh, good question. Where do you, where do you uh, all stand? Uh, you know, a scientist is not willing to speculate. Uh, it's hard. You're, you're hard pressed to find a scientist who's willing to speculate because we want evidence. That's the whole reason why we do science, right? We're searching for evidence. Um, but my, my observation is that scientists are very optimistic about the prevalence of life in the galaxy. Um, you know, for my, myself, I kind of swing back and forth between two poles. One, on one side, you've got plural, the plurality of worlds camp. Uh, and those people say there's just so many planets out there and so many stars and so many galaxies. There's just, it's just too much real estate not to have life. And then on the other, in the other camp, I call that the rare earth camp. You have the people that say, yeah, but so many coincidence had, coincidences had to align in order to create life here on planet earth. So maybe it is rare. Um, and I kind of swing back and forth. I can see the logic of both of those arguments. The reality is that we don't know. Yeah. Um, but my personal feeling, my personal observation is that we see complexity in terms of molecules everywhere we look. You have the basic building blocks of life everywhere, in comets, in the interstellar medium, you know, elsewhere in the solar system, we see the complex organic molecules that are the building blocks of things like RNA and amino acids. Um, and moreover, uh, simple single-celled life started on planet Earth almost immediately after the Earth formed, right? It just, boom, you have a living world, right? Now, granted, that life was was simple. It was not complex life. Complex life didn't arrive for another few billion years with the rise of the eukaryotes, where you had one kind of cell eat another kind of cell and form uh, an ener energy powerhouse in its in its nucleus, uh, what we call a eukaryote um, that had mito a mitochondria in the nucleus. That only happened once on planet Earth, in the entire history of planet Earth. That singular event only happened once. So, and it caused an explosion in the diversity of life. All of a sudden, complex life arises and you've got everything from insects and, and plants all the way up to mammals and, and dinosaurs, right? So it, it just spawned this huge diversity of life. But again, that only happened once. So my personal view is that we are definitely going to find microbial life, but whether or not we find complex life, that I'm, I'm not sure. And it's just simply because we only have an example of one. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm the same. I just keep going around and around in a circle, which is just like, it should be everywhere, yet where is it? It should be everywhere, but where is it? And you just, you'll just drive yourself crazy. Um, let's talk about sort of the, the, the next projects that you're working on and some of the upcoming missions. Because I, you know, Kepler was, was sort of, a, you know, is, but was really going to help us get, I, my hope was that we would find that holy grail. We were going to find that Earth-sized world orbiting within the habitable zone of a sun-like star. And we're still not quite 
there. Like that. that well, you know, we have a, a, new, a press event on Monday. That's right. Uh, there, that's people have been mentioning this in the comments that you guys are going to have a press event on Monday. So, so there you go. You just spilled the beans. Um, we're going to find. I, a... I said nothing. <laughs> but about. so I'm simply pointing out that we have a there press is a press event but... on Monday. But let's talk about sort of what's next and what's going to take us across that that first you know that next milestone. What uh, you're, you're working on tests, which is coming up and, and what sort of else is coming down the pipe? Yeah, um, well, I should say first off that with so, so we are releasing our final catalog of exoplanets uh, from the final search of the Kepler prime data. So first four years of mission, uh, we're doing that on Monday. So stay tuned. Um, but I would say that years ago, the, the results from Kepler already clearly pointed out that Earth-sized planets are common, very common in the galaxy. And that catalyzed uh, a lot of thinking about how we're going to find life beyond the solar system. I really think it opened, completely opened up a third pathway for finding life beyond Earth. You know, there's, there's the SETI searches that looks for complex technology kind of signals um, and then there's solar system exploration, like going to Europa and Celadus, exploring caves, subterranean caves on Mars and the like. But this third pathway was catalyzed once we knew the Earth-like planets were common. Um, so I was involved in an effort, for example, several years ago, which was a road mapping effort for NASA, uh, where we laid out a 30-year plan for finding evidence of life on exoplanets. In fact, it was a road map for all of astrophysics. But the search for life comprised one of three chapters for um, the astrophysics portfolio for NASA. And in that, in that roadmap, we um, called out the need for a um, large aperture space-based telescope uh, to do direct imaging to find all of the Earth-sized planets in the habitable zones of G-type stars in the solar neighborhood. So there are science and technology definition teams right now hard at work doing concept studies for such missions. Um, and, and those missions will come after W first launches in the mid 2020s. We'll start to build those missions, which is just shows how long it takes to plan these things, right? They take a long time. Um, but maybe your question is more immediate about you know, what's in the near term future. Yeah, well, just some of the upcoming missions that are going to help kind of, you know, take things to the, you know, to the next level. But but yeah. absolutely. I mean, I, I just, you know, we've had on some people from some of the other missions. And I mean, there is there is an, an explosion of telescopes coming out, both ground and space based that is going to. We thought we've seen another a lot of planets now. I mean, it's just, it's just yeah. about to get started. Yeah, so I, I would say that the next um, most immediate thing that's going to happen is a dynamic duo, which is TESS and JWST. Uh, we've got a surveyor telescope called TESS, which is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey. Well, now I'm forgetting what the extra S is. Uh, Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Uh, so TESS is uh, four telescopes mosaic together and it's going to survey the entire sky and also look for transiting exoplanets, but it's, it's looking for all the nearest transiting systems. Um, and it is going to find transiting planets that can then be observed by the James Webb Space Telescope. And the name of the game here is to begin to characterize the atmospheres of planets. Um, and to look at them in a statistical sense, you know, what is the diversity of atmospheres that we see out there? Uh, and so, so that's what James Webb is, is geared up to do. And James Webb will launch in October of 2018. Uh, TESS will launch just before that. I'm not formally involved with TESS right now, but I can imagine that over the next year or two, uh, a lot of us from the Kepler project will work in advisor-like roles or become involved at some level. Um, I am involved with JWST. We're writing proposals already to... Um, decide what the very first exoplanet targets we want to look at are with the James Webb Space Telescope. So that's really exciting. JWST is starting to feel like it's really, you know, about to happen. Um, so that, that's the immediate future. Um, after JWST launches, we finish up a telescope called WFIRST, 
Uh, WFIRST is a microlensing experiment. It's, it's also finding exoplanets, but with a technique that's sensitive to the colder outer parts of, of solar systems, like from the Earth going outwards. So really the giant planets, where the giant planets reside in our own solar system. And so Kepler was sensitive and did, did demographic uh, studies for planets orbiting at the Earth's orbit and inward, the inner planetary systems. WFIRST is going to do the same for the outer cold uh, parts of the planetary systems. And so once we have both results from Kepler and WFIRST, we should have a complete census of exoplanets in the galaxy. Absolutely fantastic. I'm, uh, I'm super, super excited. The so so place your bets. Um, when do you think that we will apart from you know, and you feel free to feign any knowledge of what's out there in the data? Um, when do you think that we will have that that capability to directly analyze the atmosphere of an exoplanet, you know, that and try to get a sense of is there life there? Um, I think that we could get lucky and do it with the James Webb Space Telescope. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the, the planetary system TRAPPIST-1 is already on the target list of, of some what we call guaranteed time observers. These are the instrument teams, people that built the instruments that will be on James Webb. They get some guaranteed telescope time um, and they've chosen to observe the TRAPPIST-1 planets. Uh, so, but, but I think it's going to be really difficult, even for TRAPPIST-1, for the habitable zone planets that are so tiny, uh, you're going to need an awful lot of data to be able to build up the signal that you need to find evidence of greenhouse gases, et cetera. But if we find something like TRAPPIST-1 that's even closer uh, to the solar system so that we can get even better precision with fewer transits, then it's, it's not impossible. So I'll hold that in my back pocket. <laughs> right, and James um, Webb is launching, what, 2018? And we'll probably be right. gathering data within a couple of years after that, so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it could happen as early as the early 2020s. Um, now, I'll point out also that, so, so then we have this other direct imaging telescope that I talked about that's kind of beyond W first. So maybe, you know, 2025, it will start building it. It'll launch in the 2030s, let's say. Um, so that telescope, if we get the funding to do it, would have the capability of taking a spectrum of light that's passing through or reflecting reflecting off the surface and passing through the atmosphere of an Earth-like planet in the habitable zone. That's what it would be built to that's do. That's LUVOIR? Well, LUVOIR is one of the one of them. Yeah, one of the concepts. concept studies that's being yeah. designed. NASA has this term, I think, New Worlds Observatory, to just kind of generically refer to all the different... Uh, thought experiments or design studies that are going on right now. There are multiple. But, you know, there's another whole uh, effort to build these extremely large ground-based yes. telescopes, like the 30-meter telescope <laughs> or the giant Magellan telescope. Um, these could very well have the capability to do what we call transmission spectroscopy, which is what James Webb will do for some of these transiting planets that test finds. Um, but from the ground and with a 30 meter aperture, right? Yeah. And so there is a possibility that these ground-based telescopes could be the first life finders for potentially habitable planets around the M type stars. So I'm really excited to see how those kind of those two pathways play out against each other. Are we going to find life around a planet orbiting a G type star from space, or are we going to find life um, on a planet orbiting in an M, an M type star from the ground using one of these 30 meter telescopes. But it is amazing, right? This, this question is perhaps one of the most fundamental scientific questions that a human being can possibly ask. Yeah, absolutely. And yet here we are within decades, potentially of, of getting an answer. It's a really exciting time. And, and yes. it's not we're not our hopes and dreams aren't in one mission, they are in a range of missions that are gonna they're gonna come down the pike shortly. So I'm, it's a it's an amazing time to be so interested Absolutely. in this. Uh, so time to wrap up our conversation with you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Where can people find out more about what you're working on? Uh, NASA.gov slash Kepler. 
uh, tons of information. And there you'll be able to find the link to the press event that's going to happen Monday morning. Um, in fact, next week we have what might be our last Kepler Science Conference. Uh, it's happening all week. And we've organized 13 public events actually that week all over the Bay Area. So if you live in the Bay Area, please check out our website and uh, find an event that's closest to you. We've got them from San Jose all the way up to Novato and as far east as Berkeley. So um, they're all over the place. So come and hang out with us and learn more. Well, Dr. Vitali, so much. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll have you back once we've found that uh, that life on that other world. Thank you for having me. And it was nice to meet right. you, Paul, too. Take care. All right. Take care. All right. On to the next segments of the show. You can just, you can just close the window if you need to. Um, uh, but not you, Paul Metzutter. No, I'm saying. Yeah, you're with us forever. Uh, well, so, so wait a minute. <laughs> well, so let's get started with uh, finally. It is the back to the bald guy council, bearded That's bald right. guy council. It's, um, a, it's a small council. <laughs> it's a small council of the two of us. All right. So first, let's get on with the. I guess the one that's really in your wheelhouse, this, uh, this announcement and, uh, you know, not going to lie, we reported it on universe today. It's fair enough to report it. Yeah. That the, uh, but we weren't like super skeptical about it. Clearly I should have talked to you first. Is the Milky way in a cosmic void? Are we in the boondocks? No. Oh. That's it. All right. So sorry. Next story. Well, no, I, I can, I can explain. Please uh, this this is a misuse of the word void when it comes to this study. This study may or may not be correct, but regardless of its correctness, it is an abuse of the word void. Uh, let me let me set up the problem here. Uh, for the past few years, we've noticed a discrepancy in our measurements of the expansion rate of our universe when we look at our nearby universe with supernova we get one number and when we look at the distant universe like say the cosmic microwave background we get a very similar but also slightly different number now this could be uh it could be nothing it could just be a statistical anomaly and with more data we'll event these numbers will eventually converge and this won't be a problem at all uh, this could be a sign that there's systematics issues, that maybe one of these numbers are mismeasured, that we're doing something wrong fundamentally. Uh, or it could be something baked into the universe itself. Maybe the expansion rate of the late day universe is different than the expansion rate of the early universe. That's a possibility. Um, if you go down that road, you can ask what's causing this. Maybe dark energy is changing with time. Maybe something funny is happening to the expansion rate, or maybe it's something else. The expansion rate of the universe is tied to the matter and energy contents of the universe. If you change the amount of dark matter, you change the amount of dark energy, you change the amount of neutrinos or normal matter or whatever, you change the expansion rate of the universe. One possible interpretation for these observations is that our local patch of the universe has a slightly different mix of elements than the bigger patch of than the whole rest of the universe on average. Now we usually assume that our local mix of matter and energy is pretty much the same as the average of the whole entire universe. This goes back to a very fundamental cosmological principle called homogeneity. The universe at big enough scales is pretty much the same from place to place. It's pretty much homogeneous. There are some indications from this group at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. who are doing some galaxy surveys in our nearby neighborhood and they've been actually pushing on this line for a few years now. So this paper that was recently announced and hit the press is actually a continuing a further study of something they've been doing for a few years already, where they're arguing that our local patch of the universe does not have the same mixture as the global universal average. 
match that maybe were a little bit under dense. Maybe there's slightly fewer voids in our local bubble, or sorry, there's slightly fewer galaxies, there's slightly less mass in our local bubble than the universe at large. And that this is enough to explain the discrepancy in the measurements of the expansion rate of the universe. If they are right, if, if continued measurements uh, bear this out, this is not what we would consider a void. This is not a completely empty region of space. It's a bubble around the Milky Way or a bubble that the Milky Way is embedded inside of that is slightly less dense than average by a couple percent. Right. That's all you need to explain the observations. So it's not a void, it's just a slightly shallow pool. <laughs> right, because <laughs> a void could be... It's like a billion light years across, which is way larger than the voids that we see in the cosmic web. Like a void, you know, at the center of a void in the cosmic web, you are looking at a density that's dramatically less than the density that we see as an average across the universe. Yes. And so then to say, well, so so the boondocks, the, the, the universal boondocks is not the best example. It is like a place that has a couple less houses than, than a normal neighborhood. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's slightly less dense than average. And so I wouldn't call it a void, is by definition is not a void, it's just a slightly under dense patch, very, very big patch of the universe. If these observations turn out to be correct, which in my, my opinion, it's still a little bit early, it's very, very hard to map out our universe uh, locally because there's so much junk in the way from our own galaxy. So there's a lot of uncertainty in these measurements. If it turns out to be true, there are some bigger problems. Um, you know, we're assuming our universe is homogenous at these scales. So we just happen to live in this slightly under dense bubble. That seems a little bit odd. It seems a little bit special, uh, but who knows? It's too early to tell. Okay. Either way, it's not a void. Okay. Definitely not a void, not a super void, not appropriate. All of you other space news people out there who reported it as the cosmic boondocks, we should all be ashamed of ourselves, including us. For multiple reasons. For multiple reasons, we should be ashamed. <laughs> this, this one in particular. I don't blame you because this actually, this wording appears in the press release yeah. from University of Wisconsin-Madison. So I put the blame here on the press release itself. It's the, it's the, office, the press officers in the universities who you as reporters are relying mm -hmm. on to give you accurate pictures of the well, research. There is supposed to be the go-between. And they knew what we they knew what we wanted to see. They knew what we wanted to hear and what we would you we wanted, would pick up. wanted the juicy bits. Yeah. Because uh, the universe is in a slight or the Milky Way is in a perhaps in a slightly less dense part than average. It it that doesn't that doesn't move eyeballs. Right. That doesn't get no, clicks. it doesn't get clicks. It's not clickbaity. Um, all right, well, let's move on to the, to the next story that you have, uh, that you've queued up. Um, let's talk about the, uh, the ring found around a galaxy's hidden black hole. Yeah, so it's, uh, we, we know that almost every galaxy essentially has a supermassive black hole in its core. And sometimes these supermassive black holes are feeding, gas is falling falling into them, swirling around, them, and then it heats up and it, it creates jets, creates what we call quasars or active galactic nuclei. And usually it's very, very difficult to see the inner parts of the galaxy when these black holes are active, when they're feeding, because they're so hot, so turbulent, you just see a, an immensely bright source near the center, and that's about it. But with some lucky observations, astronomers were able to not see the black hole itself, but to see the swirling gas, the disk 
that forms around the black hole before it falls, uh, falls in. Uh, the disk is rather large here, about 2,000 light years across, but they could actually uh, see the motion of the gas. They could see how it's rotating around. So they could determine the properties of that central black hole uh, very, very well, just based on the properties of this ring of material of swirling gas and dust uh, surrounding it, which is really cool. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, we are in consensus. We are in consensus. That the is council cool. has decided. It's, it's no direct photograph from the Event Horizon Telescope, so but waiting, it is waiting definitely... On that, waiting on that one. But, I mean, the conditions around these supermassive black holes, these actively feeding black holes, are pretty ferocious. And I guess, is this one of the ways that astronomers figure out the rotation speed of the black hole is by measuring the, the movement of this gas around it? Yeah, exactly. Like you said, the environment around these supermassive black holes, these quasars, these active galaxies are the most powerful engines in the universe. They are the brightest sources, second only to the Big Bang in terms of light output. Uh, and they're incredibly complex, incredibly turbulent. You can figure out the rotation speed of the black hole based on the properties of the gas around it. Also, if the black hole is emitting jets and you know those emitted jets, the emitted light output has to be tied to the rotation speed of the black hole. That's part of the process that's powering it. You can do some computer simulations, some modeling to back out uh, what the, the rotation speed of the black hole ought to be to power something like that. Um, okay. Again, we concur. It's a cool, it's a cool result. Uh, let's move on and talk about the hottest planet ever. Hottest planet ever. No exaggeration. What's the number here? It is 7,800 degrees Fahrenheit or 4,300 Celsius. Kelt 9b. That is high. Kelt 9b, it's a planet twice the mass and three times the radius of Jupiter. It is a hot Jupiter, as you might imagine. I mean, when you get up in the thousands of degrees, uh, you, you're generally considered a hot Jupiter. This is a class of exoplanets that, when they were discovered, totally surprised everybody. Nobody thought that you could get a massive planet Jupiter, Saturn size, or even bigger, that close to the, a star, even closer than the orbit of Mercury. We just, I don't know, we just, we just didn't think that could be a thing. Turns out it's ridiculously common. And this planet is, uh, was, I should give a shout out to the discoverer of it, or co-discoverer, Scout Gowdy, a researcher right here at Ohio State, found it. So good job. Good job, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> get, gotta get him on the show sometime we you know you absolutely should he's he's an excellent speaker uh genius monster when it comes to exoplanets uh the leader of uh this w first exoplanet mission that was just talked about but i mean this is a planet that is as hot as a star yes uh, close to the temperature, surface temperature of our own sun. <laughs> it is orbiting It is orbiting a, a very, very large star that I think is three times bigger than our own sun, emitting a tremendous amount of ultraviolet light. It's tidally locked, so it's got one face right up against that immensely bright star, and it's just getting cooked. It's actually losing its atmosphere. We predict it has a comet-like tail, so imagine a comet the size of Jupiter. It is losing its mass as we speak. It is getting cooked alive. Yeah, there's a great animation on the uh, on the article that you directed at it, and you can just see this comet. So, so the only way that this thing can exist is because the star is so young. Come back, check back in a few million years, and it it will be the planet's goner. It it'll be gone. Now, is it going to get pushed? The star will die. We well, don't know which will come first. Really, that's interesting. So, I mean, it is. A, it's a as you say, it's a it's a hot star, much larger than the sun. They live sh short lives, and they mm -hmm. explode a supernova fairly uh, quickly. So, 
and then the planet is in this sort of horror of a space where it's just getting blasted with all this radiation. Right. Is it possible that it could be sort of re pushed further out by is is this light pressure acting as a thrust to push this planet out? I don't think even with this amount of output, I'd have to run the numbers, but when, if you're at three times the mass of Jupiter, uh, your surface area to volume ratio is, is pretty low. So you're probably not going to get a lot of radiation pressure out of this. But it does, you're it just, does, you're it just, does have a tail. So I wonder if it's just going to lose its mass over the. Yeah. Over so that's period. what they're yeah. wondering uh, if it's, if it's mass loss is high enough, it will completely evaporate before the star dies. Really interesting. That's uh that's pretty cool. And, and it, it, you're exactly right. I mean, it was, it's so fascinating how astronomers had no expectation that, that these kinds of worlds, these hot Jupiters w were even possible. And yet as they started to do their searches for planets, these were the worlds that turned up first because they're yeah. so close to their parent star. They're orbiting around the detection using that the radio velocity method, as we mentioned earlier, is so powerful. Yeah. And, and, uh, and we're still not exactly sure how hot Jupiters get so hot and how they, and how they can form, right? The, I, that this whole idea of planetary migration is, is much more, I mean, it's almost like what we're seeing is we're not seeing the same kinds of, of planetary systems that we see in our own, that we thought our solar system was going to be the template for other, you know, you'd have an inner rocky area and then you'd have a bunch of gas giants and then you'd have these ice worlds further out and then you'd have but we're actually seeing they're mixed up. There's big planets that are closer to the star. There's rockier planets that are a little further out that, that by no means is the solar system an average example of what you might yeah. find out there. It, it's a madhouse out there. It's a madhouse out there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's move on to the next one. Uh, and last one, which is um, weighing a white dwarf. Ooh. Question, was Einstein right? I. Uh, about uh, well, general relativity. Yeah, this is one of the this is one of the things that they did. Is he because he was wrong about a few things? But that's another show. So talk about the story. Uh, yeah, so uh, you can we know through general relativity that uh, massive objects can bend the path of light because a ma massive object will warp and flex the fabric of space time underneath it. Beams of light prefer. In fact, they will always go in straight lines, but if the space-time underneath them is curved, they'll be forced to follow that curvature. And so you can get light bending around a massive object. And it, it was the observations of Sir Arthur Eddington that saw the bending of light around our own sun that was one of the first key pieces of evidence that general relativity was an accurate description of gravity. And... Einstein thought, hey, maybe someday you could do this around another star. If you looked at a distant star and it just happened to cross the line of sight with a background star, then that light from that background star will get bent just a little tiny bit. And in principle, you could measure this and use that to weigh the mass of the intervening star. But you know, with, with early 20th century technology, there was no way that was going to happen. Fast forward a hundred years and a couple generations of very clever astronomers. Here we are where we've directly measured the mass of a white dwarf because it crossed in front of the line of sight of another star. It bent the light of that star. And by the amount of bending, we are able to directly calculate the mass and the radius of that white dwarf. And what do they measure the white dwarf mass as? I don't know if you saw it. Uh, was it 1.4 solar masses? It was It was what we expected a white dwarf to be. I don't know. I didn't see the exact number. Yeah. But I know white dwarfs are around 1.4 solar masses. Well, you don't want to get any more than that, though. If you get more than that, then uh, it's, it's, it's neutron star time. Or it's we're going to blow up in a nova. Or supernova. So this is, I mean, I guess this is what I was mentioning in the beginning, which was, was Einstein right? They used 
the you know they used his technique of gravitational lensing mm -hmm. to determine the mass of the white dwarf which is right and the and the mass that they directly measured uh was in line with our predictions and with our estimates from other techniques how accurate is this measurement compared to other other methods like like typically when astronomers are looking to measure the mass of an object it needs to be in some kind of binary pair right. with and another that's, star. that's how we get a lot of white dwarf masses um and also we get white dwarf masses from theoretical calculations uh, this is in principle much more accurate and for a much greater range of white dwarfs we don't have to rely on binary ones uh, it depends on how well we can observe the background star uh how much it shifts uh, uh you know how close they are uh along our line of sight in principle it can be much more accurate i'm guessing at this early stage it's not going to be more accurate but uh it's just another tool in the toolbox i mean in reading the story it's kind of fascinating right the astronomers went and looked at this big area of stars looked for you know mapped the position and motions of like about 10,000 stars and just waited for the one that was going to pass that they knew was going to pass in front of a more distant background star. And, and that is a very clever sort of technique to, to do that. Yeah. You got to wait. You, for yeah. In all these astronomical techniques, we're, we're, we're coming into the era of accidental astronomy where we're relying on chance events. Like it's incredibly rare for these lineups to happen. But if you watch enough of the sky for long enough, somewhere in that field of view during your observing campaign, it's bound to happen. Just you're looking at enough stuff. So it's like, we're just waiting for these accidents to happen. And we're taking advantage of them to learn about the universe. Yeah, absolutely phenomenal. Really exciting. Um, all right, Paul, I think we're sort of reaching the end of our show. As uh, as I mentioned, this is the penultimate, or sorry, the, the semi, semi penultimate show. So there's going to be two more episodes of the weekly space hangout after this. Where can people find out more? They can find out more by following me on Twitter and Facebook. My name is at Paul Matt Sutter. You can also go to my website, pmsutter.com. There's links to all my education and outreach activities, include my own podcast, Ask a Spaceman, where I do this which is answer questions about space and time. And it's super fun. And that is people can contribute to that show at patreon.com slash PM Sutter. That keeps all of my education outreach activities alive. Fantastic. So just want to remind everybody, of course, this, as I mentioned, this is the, you know, there's two more shows after this. So definitely come back next Friday and the Friday after that. Uh, but we're going to go off and do astronomy cast. We're going to be doing the final episode of astronomy cast in about half an hour. This is where Dr. Pamela Gay and I are going to wrap up season 10. Can you believe it of astronomy cast and look forward to the next what are the future missions that we're excited about? And so, you know, how many total episodes of astronomy cast have you guys done? I don't know. 400, someone will know 430 Jeez. something. Yeah. I don't, I don't keep track of the numbers. It's too many. Uh, haven't you run out of stuff to talk about? No, we'll never, we'll never. Haven't you? We'll never run out of things. No, to talk I have about. a backlog of uh, yeah. literally 400 questions. I've done, three what am i working on now episode 310 i think of even the guide to space that i do wow and and i again like you must have a list of about 150 topics that i'm going to be able to cover and it's i i just keep shuffling but the but the new ideas keep coming to my head and they keep coming to the yep. top yep. so that's the one that i always keep dealing with but uh, no no absolutely we've got we've got years and years and years of material and turns out space keeps changing we keep discovering Who new knew? things, so there's a lot, there's a lot we more to do. We haven't learned all there is to learn. Uh, again, a reminder that if you want to join the WSH crew, go to whoops, go to wshcrew.space, and you can uh, join this community that's down here. It's totally free, and they are the producers. Again, I had no idea that Dr. Vitalia was going to be the guest until I checked the spreadsheet and noticed who was coming. Uh, so that's that's how this works. If you want to talk, see us interview people about space and astronomy, join this community, become one of the executive producers of the show, and uh, we'll be glad to have you help out. All right, time to wrap things up. We'll see you all. Let's go back to where's, there we go. We'll 
see you all uh, next week, and we'll see those of you who want to come join us on Astronomy Cast. We'll see you in about 30 minutes. See you later. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Fraser.